Could Ukraine still win the war? Hey there, visual politics community. The long-awaited counter-offensive of 2023 ultimately failed to meet its major objectives. Zelensky's troops have not managed to break through. Neither the Leopards, nor the Challengers, nor the Bradleys they received were enough. Of course, in recent months, Ukrainian forces have continued to cause great material and human damage to the Russian armed forces. They have even stopped Moscow's latest major offensive in its tracks. But ultimately, they have been able to break through Russia's defenses and regain ground. And now, to top it off, the US Congress Congress is holding up the $60 billion aid package designed by the Biden administration. As you can imagine, this has set off all the alarm bells. Is the war on its last legs? Is there no other option than the surrender of Ukraine? Where exactly are we? Why didn't the counteroffensive work? Well, in several videos here on Visual Politic, we are going to tell you exactly what is happening, where we are, and what scenarios we are facing. So now that you know, if you don't want to miss it, don't forget to subscribe to Visual Politic if you haven't already done so. And if you are already subscribed and you find this topic interesting, interesting, don't forget to like this video. That will help us out a lot. For now, in this first video in the new series on Ukraine, we will start by answering the most important question in this whole story. Could Ukraine still win this war? Well, let's get into it. The Ukrainian counteroffensive did not succeed. It failed. But Russian troops have not managed to change the dynamics of the fighting either. Let's just say that the war is practically in the same place. The bloody battles go on and on without anything changing substantially. And that is why they doubt that the answer to this question is yes. Could Ukraine win the war? However, as we're going to see in this video, despite all that has been said, this is still a feasible scenario, provided that some requirements are met. But first of all, we need to consider what Moscow is doing. If they are not making progress either, why on earth are they still fighting? Why are they still bombing Ukraine? And why are they still trying to launch new offensives? What the hell are they up to? Well, let's just say it's mostly a matter of time and expectations. Let me explain. The Euro-Atlantic community has been key in guaranteeing the Ukrainian resistance. However, they have not managed to convince Moscow of one thing, that they cannot win this challenge. The Kremlin believes that sooner or later, all this aid will disappear. And so will Ukraine's will to resist. That is precisely why they are following a plan of attrition based on what could be called strategic patience. And what does this plan consist of? Moscow wants to make this war seem never-ending, and this will make NATO throw in the towel. In order to achieve this, they have reinforced their defenses, and every now and then seek to launch offensives that may go nowhere, but which, nevertheless, help to keep the tension high, and at the same time, feed the feeling that there is no way out. Of course, in Moscow, they have no problem in assuming massive human losses. Why? Well, because, from their perspective, they have a numerical advantage. We're talking about the good old Russian steamroller. For example, it is estimated that Russia has the capacity to train, to some degree, and send to the front some 130,000 soldiers every six months. Of course, we are not talking about troops with great combat capability, but they are key to maintaining the lines of defense. Second, with this sustained campaign of ground and air attacks, along with the blockade of the Black Sea, the Russians hope to cripple the Ukrainian economy to the point where Ukraine becomes too great a burden for the Allies. That is why the pursuit of strategic civilian targets is important. Third, and closely related to the previous point, the priority for Russia, even above military objectives, is to attack critical infrastructure such as power plants and water facilities. This not only paralyzes economic activity, but also increases the suffering and therefore the exhaustion of the civilian population. In this way, Russia hopes to erode support for the war and the Zelensky government. Fourth, Russia is launching everything, missiles, drones, rockets, with a very clear objective to exhaust Ukraine's anti-aircraft defenses. Both both the Soviet Origins S-300s, which are already very short of ammunition, and the Western systems themselves, if successful, Russia could initiate medium-altitude bombing raids on the front, exposing the Kyiv troops to brutal punishment. And finally, Russia is taking advantage of this drawn-out time to expand its military-industrial complex. Above all, in terms of the production of ammunition for artillery, drones, and missiles. Well, these are the five major points of the Russian plan to make both Kyiv and its NATO allies give in, and also the ultimate reason why they are not ready to throw in the towel either. I'm sure now you will understand the new offensives and the constant attacks on civilian facilities. 
Kremlin continues to believe that they will eventually succeed in winning this war. Or at worst, they will get a ceasefire agreement, very advantageous to them. And in a way, as long as you don't care how many casualties you have to suffer, it's not a bad plan. In fact, not yet two years after the outbreak of the war, we are already at this point in the West. Republicans block aid to Ukraine, jeopardizing its fight against Russia. Meanwhile, the Ukrainian army also has serious problems of its own. Problems that largely explain the failure of the counteroffensive. For example, due to the Russian invasion, their army went from 150,000 troops to more than 700,000 troops. Yet, they lack officers and a sufficiently developed command structure. On top of that, the training of these soldiers is limited. For example, so far about 100,000 soldiers have been trained by NATO countries. Well, we are talking about a training period of only five weeks. A clearly insufficient period. To give you an idea, during the Second World War, British infantry training lasted more than 20 weeks. And to top it off, they are short, very short, of supplies. And we are not only talking about tanks and anti-tank systems. Ukraine is starting to run short of everything, including what has perhaps been one of the most important components of this war today, ammunition for artillery. While Russia, for instance, has managed to mobilize 3.5 million artillery howitzers, and by 2024 this figure is expected to exceed 4.5 million, the reality in Ukraine is very different. In fact, it is estimated that the entire European and North American production of new howitzers is only around 1 million units per year. There are plans to increase this production, but for now, this is the reality. Yes, the Ukrainians gain in effectiveness, intelligence, range, and precision, which is no small feat, but they need more supplies. And the truth is that right now, as we have already said, supplies are critically low. But then, taking all this into account, how on earth can we say that Ukraine could still win this war? Well, let's take a look. How to win the war. Okay, many of you may be fed up with this war. At the same time, others probably think that there is nothing to be done, that the conflict has dragged on for too long, and that Ukraine will never be able to defeat Russia. But don't be too hasty to jump to conclusions. It is still too early to throw in the towel. This at least is what many military intelligence experts in former Soviet Europe think. For example, intelligence analysts in the Baltic countries are very clear. This war can be won if there is commitment. Perhaps the mistake has been to think that it had to be a quick war. For Ukraine to achieve victory, the first thing to do is to convince the Kremlin that only defeat awaits them in this war. Our strategic task is to change Russia's war calculations and eliminate any prospect of success by military force or diplomatic means at the expense of Ukraine. To achieve this, we just need to maintain a little more commitment to Ukraine. And you know what? We're not talking about a great effort. The Ukrainian Defense Contact Group, also known as the Ramstein Group, which is the club of the 54 countries that support Ukraine's defense with deliveries of equipment and money and have a combined GDP of more than $50 trillion, almost 30 times the size of the Russian economy. In economic terms, we're talking about nothing short of the largest alliance ever built. Well, despite everything you may have heard, so far the direct cost of the Ukrainian war has been very small. These countries have, so far, provided about $110 billion in aid. That is a lot of money, but it barely represents about 0.2% of their GDP. In other words, a very small and perfectly manageable amount, which, on top of that, has been spread over several years. In other words, the real effort has been, in most cases, trivial. What's more, just by increasing the effort by 0.05% of GDP, we would be talking about 120 billion euros more for Ukraine between 2024 and 2025. Five, an amount sufficient to cover the cost of the war for at least two years. In other words, let's not fool ourselves. All this is fundamentally a question of will. In fact, the military budgets of the Ramstein coalition together exceed 1.24 trillion. That is, 13 times Moscow's military spending. Besides, while the prolongation of the war may be bad for Ukraine, don't think it is much better for Russia either. Visual politic viewers, the Russian government is making a huge effort to sustain its military campaign. Yes, well, here on YouTube and also on TV and in the traditional media, you are sure to find many people saying that Russia has almost inexhaustible batteries. However, this is not true. 
The war is costing Russia about 1 trillion rubles, just over 11 billion dollars every month. According to NATO sources, war expenses already account for more than 30% of all public spending in the country. In other words, the war is being fueled at the cost of huge cuts in education, healthcare, and infrastructure, and also by depleting the reserves of Russia's National Wealth Fund. And then, of course, added to all this are the huge human losses. In the long run, this will not only damage the Russian economy, but also make the war increasingly unpopular. And while Russia, which is not exactly a rich country, spends more than $11 billion every month on the war, the cost to the huge coalition of countries that make up the Ramstein Group has so far been less than half that. The imbalance of forces is more than evident. And that's not all. If this war has shown us anything, it is that Western armies, especially European ones, have major shortcomings, starting with the fact that they are also very short of supplies, especially following the support to Ukraine. To make matters worse, the military production chains are very limited. In other words, they are clearly insufficient for sustaining a major war effort if necessary. But take note, because this is something that aid to Ukraine itself could change. How can this be done? Very easily. By increasing factory orders and investments in the sector. <laughs> Ukraine needs artillery, ammunition, drones, air defense systems, fighter jets. But it is not only Ukraine that needs it, but also the Western armies, including the United States. In that vein, war funding could help increase industrial production capacity enough to arm Western militaries for the next decade. And all the while defending Ukraine, defeating Russia, and giving a wake-up call to any other mad tyrants who might consider turning the international order upside down. Well, with all this, the idea would be to guarantee the defense of Ukraine in 2024, the exhaustion of the Russian effort, and the start of a major offensive in 2025. Yes, okay, I know, I know what many of you are thinking. 2025? Are you kidding, Josh? Well, what do you want me to say? That's the thing about wars. They don't have to be short if you want to win them. But let's be more specific. In order to fulfill this plan, it is necessary to punish Russia's resupply with long-range precision strikes. In other words, Ukraine has to be able to employ more of the US tactical missile system with the HIMARS it already has. Second, Ukraine has to have the capability to deliver constant fire on Russian troops. So you have to increase howitzer production capacity and in the meantime, increase deliveries even if Western stocks fall to red line levels. Third, the Russian fleet's ability to operate in the Black Sea must be blocked. And fourth, more anti-aircraft firepower must be deployed in Ukraine. This would buy enough time to A, rebuild military production capabilities and B, prepare and train Ukrainian forces to conduct large-scale offensive operations. No more experiments. For example, Ukraine needs a growing supply of howitzers to use at least 200,000 every month. That is almost 2.5 million howitzers per year. Remember that right now, the US and European production of new howitzers is in the neighborhood of 1 million. So what does that mean? That maintaining the war effort in Ukraine may end up depleting Western arsenals. So it is clear that many more are needed, both for this war and to dissuade Russia, China, or any other tyrant from being too clever. And exactly the same is true of artillery launch drones, and long-range missiles themselves. It's a similar story, of course, with aircraft. And here, NATO could make a significant decision. In addition to delivering F-16s, they could also prepare new units of the Swedish Saab Gripen. They could even buy the entire production line of this aircraft. The Gripen is a multi-role aircraft that was designed precisely to fight when outnumbered and to be repaired, refueled, and rearmed in the most unexpected places, such as, for example, a roadside post manned by just five or six soldiers. The fact is that with all this effort, two major objectives could be achieved at a very low cost for the West. First, make it clear to the Kremlin that this war will not end in 2024, whatever they do. And second, to rebuild the military capabilities and, therefore, the deterrence capacity of the West. And what can I say? There doesn't seem to be much of an alternative either. <laughs> If Ukraine loses the war, that would be a disaster, not only for the security of Europe, but we would also be telling the world that, in practice, autocratic countries like Russia, China, or Iran can do whatever they want. That would obviously be terrible news. The 2023 counteroffensive failed, and with it went the plans that this could be a shorter war. However, that doesn't mean it has to be lost. At a very low cost, the West can not only support an ally and add a new member to the club of free countries, but also, and perhaps above all, gain a great deal in security. 
It would be, so to speak, one of the cheapest investments for ensuring international security. The alternative would be Putin's victory. The plan recommended by many analysts in the countries most exposed to Russia, such as the Baltic Republics and Poland, is exactly the one we have seen. The question is, what will be done in the end? Do you think Ukraine can really win this war? Leave us your impressions in the comments and let's start the debate. In future videos, we will get closer to the reality of Ukraine. So subscribe to the channel if you haven't already done so. Thank you very much for watching. All the best. See you next time.